Hey everybody, welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ and my guest tonight is Janice Stanger, PhD. Dr. Stanger is the author of The Perfect Formula Diet, How to Lose Weight and Get Healthy Now with Six Kinds of Whole Foods. She is a health and wellness expert and a plant-based advisor and educator and has worked with employers and individuals for over 30 years. Please welcome Dr. Stanger. Thanks so much for being here. I'm very pleased to be here. Yeah, and you know, you had sent me when you were sending me your bio, these two one-hour-long presentations on YouTube that were done by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii when you spoke there. And they're, by the way, they're excellent, and I hope everybody will watch them. I especially like the dangerous truth about protein because everybody seems to have this false belief that we need so much of this, you know, revered nutrient, and you really, you really did a great job of explaining it. Well, thank you. Yeah, it is a big reason why people are so unhealthy is they're eating way too much protein and they're totally fixated on it. Right. And I love what you said is that when you're, that when you're eating um, the protein of an animal, you're really eating the protein of a plant that the animal ate. That made it so, you know, <laughs> you know they, they say don't say cut out the middleman, but that's sort of what you were saying is that there's nothing special about the protein from an animal. Well, there's nothing special that's good. There are things about it that are bad, but there's absolutely nothing special that's good. (laughs) Yeah. Well, so how did you get so interested in this, Dr. Stanger? Because I'm not sure all my listeners are familiar with you or your book. So please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in plant-based nutrition. Well, I got interested in it because of my children, who at the time, uh, back in 1995, were 11 and 13, and they both announced they weren't going to eat meat anymore. And I, of course, was horrified because I grew up in Philadelphia, and in Philadelphia that's pretty much what people eat. I mean, everything's yeah. around me, pretty much every meal. So well, you I, know, I'm, I went to college at the University of Pennsylvania, and Pat's Cheesesteak was the most popular place in the whole city. Oh, absolutely, yeah, cheesesteaks and corned beef and pastrami and, you know, ribs and, and just pretty much any kind of meat were – we're just the center of every single meal and snack. and So I really thought, AJ, I'm not exaggerating here, but I honestly thought they were going to get sick and die if they didn't eat meat. And <laughs> yeah, so and I spent several weeks trying to get them to eat meat. Didn't work. It kind of oppositional defiant. So then I thought, well, I better do some research because this is probably just a short-term little fad on their part to upset mom. Uh-huh. And so all I have to do is figure out a way to keep them alive a few months and they'll get tired of it and I'll go back to eating meat. Uh-huh. So I started doing a lot of nutrition, but because of my academic background, I was researching and reading like nutrition textbooks, medical textbooks, medical journals, things like that, rather than you know just popular books on nutrition. And when you start doing that, you get a lot of facts that you wouldn't otherwise get, as uh-huh. you all know. So I was uncovering the fact that pretty much everything I learned about nutrition my entire life was backwards. Wow. In other words, I was told something by my middle school teacher and, you know, any healthcare professional and the media and everything else. The truth was actually 180 degrees opposite. Mm. And so that's how I kind of got hooked on doing it. And, and the kids, by the way, never did start eating meat again. In fact, four years later... I became totally plant-based, and then, of course, they couldn't have mom being core than them, so they immediately became vegan as well. So, well, what, Can I ask Dr. Stanger, if they were 11 and 13, what made them come home from school one day and decide they weren't going to eat meat anymore? Because I think that's kind of interesting that two kids that young made that decision. You know, I was never able to get a really coherent reason out of them. It could well be that the original motivation was kind of vague and they really just knew it would upset me and they thought that would be a fun thing, you know, ha-ha, let's get mom upset today. Or maybe they had some other motivations, but they couldn't really articulate it that well other than they weren't going to eat it. But they felt very strong. I remember when we were first vegetarian we went to one of these soup and salad places, and this was very soon after we were vegetarian, so we hadn't learned all the tricks of the trade because that takes a while to learn. So we went up and got some vegetable soup. We thought it was vegetarian, and we asked the guy, and he's like, yeah, it was. So we went back, and we started eating, and we started, this tastes weird, this tastes weird. So we went back, asked for a list of ingredients, and, of course, it had beef in it. Mm. So older daughter and I were kind of philosophical, like, okay, we made a mistake. We're going to learn for it. We'll be more careful next time. 
my younger daughter just started crying uncontrollably. She was probably of like 11 or 12 at the time, just crying wow. uncontrollably. And we said, you know, why are you crying? We didn't know. And she said, I just ate a cow. Ah. So, you know, they, I, I think they might have had some animal motivations, animal related, but they couldn't really articulate it that well mm-hmm. at the ages they were. Yeah. And, and, and have they remained plant-based still today? Oh, absolutely, yes. They are very big advocates of plant-based eating of, with okay. all their friends and, and pretty much everyone they eat and everything they do, plant-based that's eating, animal rescue, and everything like that. They're, that's, they're that's, very active that's in that. That's, that's excellent. And so so that's, you know, what you're saying is what a lot of doctors that eventually uh, turn to a plant-based diet say is that everything they learn about nutrition was basically wrong. Exactly. And and when you learn it, you know, you distrust the government and so on on other things. Maybe like you might not believe everything they, they tell you about certain topics. But nutrition, you hear from so many sources that, I mean, I for one, until I began doing research, just kind of took it for granted that everything I've been told was true. There was no reason to really question it. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. So what, what's keeping you busy these days? How are you spreading the message? I think you're speaking at the Wellness Forum uh, Conference next month, are you? Yeah, I'm speaking at the Wellness Forum Conference, and I recently moved from a corporate setting. I've been working in corporate America doing wellness and with employers on all aspects of their uh, medical plans, not just um, wellness and health, but you know, pretty much everything. So I've moved to a setting where I'm really just working on whole food, plant-based nutrition. And so what will remain to be done, I don't know. I'm kind of getting settled into this at this point. But uh, what I aim for is a lot more presentations, uh, a lot more writing, maybe writing another book or a lot more articles, uh, you know, kind of spreading the message however I best can, working with other people. I love to team up and work with other people and really kind of amplify. And I think when people work together as a team, they can have a much bigger impact than each separately. Mm-hmm. So that's my goal of what I'm working toward at this point. Uh, talk a little bit about your book, The Perfect Formula Diet, and what um, what gave you the impetus to write it, and um, what would we get out of reading it? Well, when I first started researching nutrition, I didn't have any uh, goal to write a book. But as I said, as I was learning all this, I began to feel pretty much betrayed and shocked by the fact that there were so many myths. And and this was uh, at a time when there was not a whole lot of good vegan nutrition information out there. There is now there's more and more good nutrition information. But, you know, at that time there was very little good information. But Mm -hmm. what I especially focused on from the beginning was protein and also the subject of inflammation because I – developed a theory that most chronic diseases are related to inflammation, and I was spending a lot of time researching that and coming up with, you know, a lot of good evidence and research and meta-analyses and so on that all chronic illness is related to inflammation. And then I was going to link that back to protein. Well, at that time, these theories started exploding about a year later that, yes, all chronic diseases are linked to inflammation. So I was very pleased to see that out there because I felt like, now everybody knew it. I didn't have to demonstrate it. So I was able to turn my attention more to just nutrition and protein. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted to show, you know, the link between animal foods and inflammation, like the the ways animal foods cause inflammation and then inflammation underlies virtually all chronic disease, you know, even things you wouldn't think about. Like people might know, okay, inflammation underlies heart disease, artery disease. They kind of know that. But in terms of inflammation underlying Alzheimer's and diabetes, uh, various kind of autoimmune diseases, cancer, and so on, all these are very closely related to chronic inflammation in the body. And chronic inflammation in the body is highly related to protein. And so I wanted to get that information out there in language that people who, you know, hadn't taken a whole lot of science could understand. I wanted to stated in a way so that if somebody had gone through school, science was not their favorite subject, you know, they never took any more than they had to, and maybe that was a few decades ago, that they would still be able to understand exactly what uh, the science was showing. Mm -hmm. And so that was my goal in writing the book was to 
get that information out there stated in a way that would be very accessible to people who are non-scientists, which are the people that need to know it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Or in the case of doctors at medical school, they also need to know it. <laughs> That's true. And, you know, it's funny you say that, AJ, because I got so much of my information, and I continue to get a huge part of my information right out of medical textbooks. I mean, I have an entire shelf of medical textbooks, and I huh. No, I read them just for fun. I guess that's a weird <laughs> thing to do, but I do. Not really. And, I I kind of like. I'm kind of a science nerd too. I love I love reading things like that. It's so I find it so interesting. It is. So you know, I'm always reading medical textbooks and coming up with information that you know doctors must know because they use these things too when they were in medical school. But the different thing is they're not thinking about it in the same way. So. The information is pretty much there in the medical textbooks that they've been taught to think about it from a certain angle that mm-hmm. prevents them from seeing all the implications and how things are actually working because they're looking at it from the angle of, okay, what prescription drug can I give somebody or what surgery? Again, right. this is doctors, but it, it's many. And they're mm-hmm. not looking at it from the angle of, let me think through to the cause of this illness, let me think through to the chain of events uh, that really are underlying the illness and what I can do about it and how is this related to lifestyle. They're not really taught to think that way, which is certainly a big deficiency in medical school. And so, you know, I do teach doctors. You mentioned the Wellness Forum. One of the things I do is, is teach a course for various medical professionals, and that includes physicians and many other medical professionals. And, you know, when I talk about protein, people realize hey, I knew all this, I already knew all this because I studied, but I just never put it together this way. It's like having a puzzle with a 100 different pieces, but that's a front side and a back side, so you're putting it together one way and it looks like picture one. But when you flip it over and you put it together another way, all of a sudden picture two becomes very clear, and then people really realize the implications. You know, doctors have to take the Hippocratic Oath, and Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine. How how did they get so far away from that? Well, you know, I think people are wanting to be high-tech, and, you know, physicians want to be high-tech, and patients want to be high-tech. And there was so much success early on with, for example, antibiotics, when you think of how people used to die at very young ages from infections that, Mm-hmm. You know, we regard today as fairly trivial. You know, maybe they would, you know, get a bad splinter and it would get infected and, you know, they, they would end up dying from the infection because it would go through their bloodstream to their heart or whatever. You know, nowadays we don't really see that as that big of an issue. So, you know, people want to find a magic pill that will work as well as the antibiotics did in terms of extending life. But the problem is that infection... And those kind of acute conditions are very different from chronic conditions, and they don't have the same cause and they don't have the same treatment. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, you talk about extending life. I mean, I think a whole food plant-based diet, if it doesn't extend life, it sure improves the quality of life. And I think it was Dr. Campbell that may have said that if the whole food plant-based diet was a pill, it would be probably like the most prescribed pill, you know, ever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And there is excellent evidence that does um, – kind of add to longevity. For example, when you think of the longest lived people on the planet, they are people who live on a plant-based diet. For example, in Okinawa, you have the highest concentration uh, against the older Okinawans, not, you know, the younger ones now who are Mm -hmm. eating junk food. But the older Okinawans have the highest concentration of centenarians, which are people over 100, of any population where it's ever been documented and proven by good validated, you know, government mm-hmm. records that are reliable. Mm-hmm. And their diet is 96% plant-based in terms of where they're getting their calories from. They only get and, about and, right. of calories and, from foods. And, and I read that about 69% of those came from my one of my favorite foods, the sweet potato. Absolutely. So, so much for, you know, starches and carbs. Yay. Lovely. I mean, these Living to be 100, and not only are they going to be 100, they're not 100 in nursing homes. They're 100 walking around the community, right. taking care of their gardens, visiting each other, being functional, cooking their own meals. I mean, they're 100 and happy and healthy. Right, not like the ones you see in the nursing homes here where maybe they are living longer, but they're certainly not living better. 
Exactly. And isn't that what we'd wish for ourselves and our family and our friends is, is that kind of happiness and health yeah. throughout life? It It's just almost enough to make you tear up to think of it, that, that people yeah. can achieve this and they're not. Yeah. Um, well, we could, but then nobody, not, a lot of, not everybody wants to go on a plant-based diet. <laughs> Well, maybe they don't know all the reasons to. That's why we still keep working. I mean, you do a huge amount of work, and so do I, and so do thousands of our colleagues, to try to show people in every way we can that, you know, this is a wonderful thing to do. It's in no way deprivation. It's a wonderful addition to your life that will make your life more enjoyable in pretty much every way. So, So what do you do, Dr. Stanger, about the people that maybe know this information but say things like, but meat tastes so good. <laughs> well, you know, there's different answers to that. The, the one that seems to work best is to tell people your taste will change. So one yeah. of the myths there is that people eat food because they like that food, and that kind of makes sense, right? Like, oh, I like ice cream, so I eat ice cream, right? Makes sense. Turns out the opposite is true. You don't eat ice cream because you like ice cream. You like ice cream because you eat ice cream. So your taste get accustomed to whatever you habitually eat, and that's what you learn to prefer. Right. if you change what you eat, you're going to change your taste. Yeah, absolutely. I say that all the time, that people develop taste preferences for what they habitually eat. That's why in some parts of the world they love crickets, and we don't. Exactly. And you have to think it's a basic survival mechanism because humans are very flexible In terms of their diet, when you look at the rest of the animal kingdom, you know, like deer maybe can only eat certain limited kinds of food and mountain lions and rabbits and so on. Humans can eat a much wider range of food and so can survive in, you know, a wide range of geographies and so on. And as, you know, people move around and are nomadic, and obviously we're talking about people a long time ago, not people now, and seasons change, and maybe there's a drought or maybe there's a flood or whatever, the foods that are available are going to change, and they're going Mm -hmm. to be changing all the time. So if humans had a fixed taste of we only like these certain foods, uh, the human species would have died out long ago because, you know, when it changed from spring to summer and they couldn't get their spring food, everybody would have starved to death. So it's just a basic (laughs) survival mechanism that your tastes are going to change to match the food that's available to you. Yeah, that that makes sense, and I see it happen all the time. What do you think that protein became such a revered macronutrient? You know, I've been uh, vegan or plant-based for almost 40 years now, and I'm telling you, Dr. Stanger, if I had a nickel for every time I heard somebody said, where do you get your protein, I'd be one of the richest people in the world. Where did that come from? I mean, I don't ever remember saying that when I wasn't vegan, so where where did that come from? Well, you know, actually, I did say when I wasn't vegan because I was brought up to think you could only get protein from certain foods, and I knew nothing about protein. I thought protein was one isolated substance, kind of like the way maybe, I don't know, iron is. Like you think iron, iron is this metal, right? There's there's like maybe one kind of iron or maybe there's a couple kinds. But the point is it, it's a very limited thing it's just a thing and so I saw protein was like that there was just this one kind of protein and as I began learning there's millions of kinds of protein there's like two million kinds of protein just in an average person and there's almost an infinite number of kinds of protein and not only that but protein uh, you know vary by individual so in other words your protein my protein not the same not the same as anyone else's on earth unless we have an identical twin so People don't know anything about protein, and they've been taught, and, you know, I don't know where the message originally came from. Certainly, it's extremely beneficial to the animal foods industry, which we know is a huge, powerful industry, so it's hard not to suspect that they were somehow wrapped up in getting this message out there, but at this point, it might be hard to trace historically to exactly how it came about. It's certainly been reinforced by the animal food industry as well as by the USDA, which shows a certain part on my plate where you're just supposed to have protein, whatever that is. So if you think of the last USDA plate, if you can picture it in your mind, it has, you know, various kinds of food on it, like grains and, you know, fruits and vegetables, and they have a little glass for dairy and so on. And those are all foods, and you could go to the store and point to them. Mm -hmm. But they have... um, 
a part of their plate that just says protein. Well, what is protein? It's not a food. It's just a macronutrient. Right. So the more you learn about protein, the more you see that actually it's based in plants. And mm-hmm. would it be okay if I just gave people a couple real brief facts so they might not be aware of? Absolutely. That's why we have you here. Please go into as much detail as you want. Okay. So the thing about protein is protein is a link chain. So just, you know, picture in your mind any kind of chain you want. It could be, you know, a, a chain link fence or a paper chain or whatever, but just a chain kind of hanging down and dangling there. And the links in the chain are called amino acids. And then the chain itself is the protein, how all these amino acids are put together and then folded. So basically there's 20 kinds of amino acids that make up all life on Earth. And so these 20 kinds of amino acids fall into two categories. You, you don't have to know all their names and all. It's really not important. And you can be quite healthy without knowing them. But there's the non-essential amino acids, And by non-essential, it doesn't mean you don't need them. Clearly, you need them. It just means you don't need them from diet because Mm -hmm. your bodies make these non-essential amino acids. Then there's the essential amino acids, which means you have to get them from diet because your body is incapable of making them. And so there's a little bit of controversy about whether there's eight or nine uh, essential amino acids. It it doesn't really matter for our purposes. Let's say there's eight because that's a more frequent number, but maybe there's nine. Who cares? So where do these essential amino acids come from? That's a central point in understanding protein as a nutrient because once you have all the amino acids, your body puts its own proteins together because remember – our proteins are all different. So mm-hmm. there's no way I can get my protein from anything I eat because it's all going to have different proteins than I do. So the only way I can get my body's own unique proteins is by getting all these amino acids and then my cells know how to put the amino acids together into proteins. And, and same about your cells and everybody's cells because nobody would be alive and, and participating in this call if they couldn't make protein. Mm-hmm. So you're going to get these amino acids. So where do they come from, these essential amino acids? Well, it turns out the reason they're essential is because they take so much energy to make. It takes a huge amount of energy to put these amino acids together, these essential amino acids. Animals don't have that kind of metabolic energy, but plants do. And why do plants have it? Because plants are solar powered, right? So plants are sitting out there in the sun. They've got their leaves spread. They're soaking in all these solar rays, and and they're turning it into food and energy. And so they are able to make these essential amino acids. And then it turns out bacteria can also make essential amino acids, which is really neither here nor there because we're not really living by eating bacteria. So the plants make these essential amino acids. And then so where do animals get their essential amino acids? Well, either they eat the plants, and they're in the plants, or they eat an animal that ate a plant. Mm -hmm. But no animal can make these essential amino acids. So sometimes you'll hear these ridiculous statements by people that don't know anything. And believe me, everything I'm telling you I've read or heard people say or seen. But, for example, one thing I've read is, you know, some nutritionist saying, well, aren't cows wonderful because they eat grass and they turn the carbs into protein? That kind of (laughs) makes me want to scream because it's such scientific... Nonsense. Cows cannot turn carbs into protein. Number one, they don't have the metabolic energy. Number two, the carbohydrates don't have nitrogen in them, and nitrogen is a hallmark of protein. So how would the cows do it? You can't turn, you just can't turn carbohydrates into protein by running it through a cow's stomach because a cow's stomach isn't going to, you know, attach a nitrogen to this chemical substance. You know, but there's just so much misinformation out there. And if people realized that plants are the base of the food chain, the plants make all the essential amino acids as well as the other things we need to survive by we, I'm kind of using the broad sense of we as the animal kingdom need to survive, you know, then people wouldn't stress about protein or any of these other things because they'd realize Plants are the base of the food chain. And once you realize that, it's a pretty simple statement. You know, most people understand the food chain, that it starts with plants. So you have to think 
plants make everything they need because they're the base of the food chain, right? Plants don't eat animals. Animals eat plants. So that pretty much shows where the nutrients are coming from, like what the flow of nutrients is. They flow from plants to animals. And that's why, you know, you don't have to worry about this whole protein thing. It's just such a myth. And wherever it came from, it ought to be abolished immediately because it's the root of keeping, you know, millions and millions of people very sick, as as well as destroying the planet, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. What are our requirements for protein? Because you you had mentioned in that in the uh, YouTube video that I saw that when we need the most protein is when we're infants, and yet I think we're getting like less than ten percent of our calories from protein from breast milk. Is that is that about right? Yeah, one of the main functions of protein is to fuel growth, and so the time when people are growing fastest is when they're infants. You know, talking about proportionally, proportionally you're growing fastest when you're an infant. And human breast milk, which pretty much nobody disputes is the perfect food for infants, is only 5 to 8% protein. So to say that adults need more protein than infants in terms of percent of calories just doesn't make any sense. Like clearly an adult needs more calories than an infant, but it doesn't need a greater percent of his or her calories from protein than an infant does. If an infant is fine growing at that uh, way, and in fact, if infants get too much protein, it will kill them because their kidneys aren't mature enough to handle that amount of protein. So it's actually deadly. If you try to feed a baby just on cow's milk, please don't do that. And, And I'm not talking about formula, but just plain cow's milk. You know, it's going to destroy the baby's kidney because the kidney has to break down the excess protein, and it's not mature enough in a young baby. You know, their their organs are still maturing, so it's very important that babies not get more protein than they're designed to get by Mother Nature. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's just really important. And and here's another reason things that people don't realize and doctors don't realize, although, again, it's in medical textbooks, why you don't need so much protein. It's because your body recycles it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got all these handy-dandy amino acids, right? You ate your kale and your potatoes and your corn and your black beans or whatever, and they all were living things at one time, so they all have plenty of amino acids. And they all, by the way, have all the amino acids, or otherwise they would never have been alive because you can't have a living thing that doesn't have all the amino acids. Mm-hmm. So you've got all these handy-dandy amino acids. So your body's not stupid. Your body doesn't say, hmm, AJ just had a great meal with all these wonderful amino acids, and we're using them here, but you know, later on maybe we're going to have to break these cells down or the cells become damaged or dies or whatever. And you know, So now we need to make a new cell in its place. Let's take all these amino acids, throw them in the garbage, and send her out to eat more, right? Your body is not that stupid. Your body says, okay, we just had to break down the cell for whatever reason uh, that the cell wasn't going to be sticking around anymore. It takes it apart, and it saves the components. It doesn't throw them out. I mean, your body's the original recycler. It's going to recycle pretty much everything in that cell. Again, it's going to recycle the amino acids. It's going to recycle the minerals. You know, it, it's going to recycle everything it possibly can because it's very efficient and it doesn't want you to have to go out and get more when maybe, you know, you're in the middle of some famine or something like that. So your body hangs on to things and reuses them again and again and again and again and again. And so we really don't need to eat nearly as much as we think we do. You, you mean in, in, we don't need to eat as much protein as we think we do or just as much food as we think we do? As much protein. We still need to eat food for energy because the main function of food is to be a source of energy to supply calories so all this can go on. I mean, you need energy, which is calories, for pretty much everything your body does. I mean, people think they need calories just to move, but you need calories to think. You need calories to pump blood. You need calories for your cells to work and make protein and uh, for your cells to break down and for your immune system to work. Everything requires energy, right? Your body runs on energy just like everything does it can't function without energy not Mm -hmm. even for a moment so that's the main thing you need enough food to supply energy but you don't necessarily need all these components like you know proteins and essential fats and minerals and so on because 
your body's going to keep reusing them. And so, you know, your body knows how many calories it needs. It knows how many nutrients it needs. That's why I like to say, you know, your body is perfect in design. Your body's self-regulating. The best thing you can do to be healthy is just get out of your own way. Stay out of your own way. (laughs) Just let your body do its job. Remember a while back, I think it might have been Frances Moore LePay, where she said that you, had, in order to get all these amino acids, you had to combine certain foods with other foods to make it a complete protein. That, that's been proven untrue, correct? Oh, absolutely. And it couldn't be true because, again, remember, all living things on Earth are from the same 20 amino acids. So the only way you could eat a plant and that um, didn't have all the essential amino acids is if you had something very highly processed. Or, right. for example, let's say you had a highly processed oil or you just had table sugar. Clearly those things are not going to have much, if any, protein in them because they've been very highly processed and separated into their component parts. So, you know, if you eat an ear of corn, just corn on the cob or, you know, corn in a you know stew or, or however you're eating it, it's going to have all the essential amino acids. If you eat corn oil or corn sugar or something, it's not because... It's been processed. So the lesson there is eat unprocessed food. Pretty simple. Yeah, it makes sense, makes sense. You know, when you talk about highly processed food, though, whether it's vegan or not, that that's also very inflammatory too, isn't it? Because you were saying that all disease is linked in inflammation, so th- th- those aren't really helpful foods as well, correct? Well, yeah, they are. They can be very inflammatory, especially extracted oils. I'm not usually concerned, and I'm probably one of the three people on the face of the planet who's not about processed sugar, as long as you're not eating tons and tons of it. But, you know, if all you're eating the entire day is one teaspoon of processed sugar in your morning oatmeal or whatever, and you're you're pretty much not eating processed foods, but you're just having tiny little bits here and there, I don't really see that as dangerous or poisonous. So nearly as much so as the extracted oils, which have so many more reasons. I mean, you have to look at all the reasons that a food can harm you. And when you start looking at the reasons a food can harm you when it's not a good food, sugar is pretty much on the bottom of the list. I mean, nobody saying sit there and eat processed sugar by the tablespoon or drink soda all day. That would clearly be a, a very unwise decision. But when you look at the way sugar harms you, they're fewer than the ways extracted oils harm you, and those are way fewer than the ways that animal foods harm you. So if you're looking at kind of pyramid of harm, the animal foods are going to be at the top and extracted oils under it and, and sugars under that. Mm-hmm. I see. But, but, but there are people, you know, I know vegans that eat pretty much all their calories from junk food and don't eat any fruits and vegetables. That can't be good. Oh, no, it's definitely not. And I know people like that, too. And they're often not very healthy, have a lot of inflammation, are overweight. And, you know, that's tragic for them. It's tragic for their families and so on. But I think it's also very tragic for the whole kind of cause, if you want to call it cause, or educational movement, or however you want to think of it, of getting people to eat plant-based. Because if somebody is living on, let's say, salmon and spinach, which might be a typical old way of eating in Atkins, and that would be the way of eating on paleo. Mm -hmm. You know, and they look at somebody who's vegan but just eating junk food and they're seeing they're overweight and unhealthy, then they're not going to want to be like them. They're not going to want them at all. I remember once I worked with a woman who was very nice, and she was naturally kind of thin and healthy, but um, her fiancé wasn't. So her fiancé, this was back before paleo went on an Atkins diet, and he lost a lot of weight, and he became much healthier. And she ate that way not because she really wanted to, but just to kind of, you know, keep him company. And she was telling me all of his health achievements, and I said, well, really, what did he eat before he went on the Atkins diet? And she immediately answered, like, oh, candy and soda and donuts and french fries and you know, hamburgers and white bread and so on. It just went on and I'm like, okay, so maybe just eating salmon and spinach for dinner maybe is better for him. doesn't mean it's yeah. optimal, but right. maybe that helped him. So, you know, it, it kind of made sense to me after she told me how he used to eat. So I think it really behooves people who are trying to spread a plant-based message to eat healthy so that people will look at them and say, hey, I want to be like that. 
I agree. I agree. Do you, do you put dairy in the same category as, as, as you know, we're doing the hierarchy that the animal protein was the worst, followed by the extracted oils, then the sugars? Do you put dairy, or, or do you put it like in its own category as maybe even being worse than meat? It could be worse than meat. When I say, you know, animal foods at the top, it's kind of hard to sort out which are the worst. Probably the single worst animal food is bacon, probably <laughs> followed cheese, um, then maybe by other dairy, uh, you know, kind of well-done meats, you know, eggs are really... It, it's kind of hard to arrange a hierarchy, but if I had to pick the single worst animal yeah. food of every animal food there is out there, I'd probably choose bacon. Wow. And, you know, bacon and cheese often come on a burger, you know what I'm saying? That's that's a, that's like a condiment these days. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there's you got your perfect synergy of everything bad you can possibly eat just in between two pieces of white bread. What more could you yeah. want? Well, that's what they do. You know, I used to work at a restaurant, and in, in order to make things sell or if something wasn't selling well, you just, you know, you throw bacon and cheese on it, and then people want it, you know. <laughs> Right, exactly. You know, they, they're poisoning their bodies, but they haven't really thought of it. You know, but, but bacon, the thing about bacon is it's usually sliced thin. So all meat, when you cook it, develops extremely hazardous chemicals. Mm-hmm. Bacon has the highest ratio of kind of like the surface of the bacon, which is where the really bad chemicals mostly form, to the interior. So if you think, for example, of a steak, it's pretty thick. So you've got a lot of the inside of the steak and not that much of the surface. But when you've got a skinny piece of bacon, it's almost all surface area. There's almost nothing between the two surfaces of the bacon. So basically you're eating pure carcinogenic chemicals when you're eating bacon. And not only that, it has that horrible smell, which some people find appetizing, but (laughs) fumes are, are also extremely hazardous and toxic. You know, yeah. which, you know, more so than almost any other food. So, and and then the other thing about bacon is, of course, you know, the infectious aspect because it comes, unfortunately, from pigs. And, you know, all factory farming generates, uh, you know, all kinds of horrible antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Uh, farming pigs especially generates MRSA, which we mm-hmm. know kills thousands of people a year and is one of the most prevalent of the antibiotic resistant bacteria. So basically, you know, you've got everything packaged together there. You've got your MRSA, you've got your toxic, you know, smoke fumes and, and you've got all these chemicals along with everything else that's in meat. So you can't really do too much worse than that. <laughs> what do you think created this insatiable American appetite for animal flesh? Because I, I see it, I see it increasing. You know, from the time that I grew up in the '60s. Oh, absolutely. Well, there's undoubtedly a lot of uh, industry influence there. Because remember, industry these industries have a lot of money, and so they're able to go out and quote unquote educate uh, RDS. They're able to educate nurses. They're able to educate physicians. And by educate, we mean educate them in their point of view, not educate them in the real facts. So, you know, they're able to sponsor conferences and get these people all thinking, oh, well, you know, people need to eat a lot of animal foods. I better work with clients to do that. On top of that, we've had, you know, one high-protein diet after another, you know, after Atkins, after many incarnations, finally started to lose its popularity. Then paleo came along and... You know, the thing about paleo is it has a much better story to tell than Atkins did. And and I don't mean a better scientific story because none of them had any science or have any science whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But they had a much more emotionally compelling story. I mean, Atkins, think of the Atkins story. It's pretty much just science-based, which most people don't get that super excited about science. Mm-hmm. You know, they'd rather get excited about you know, something they care about, their family or their sports team or their hobby or whatever, and not so much science for most people. So the thing about paleo is it tells a very primal story of how you can connect with your ancestors from millions of years ago just by, you know, eating meat and sucking on bones and things like that. So people these days feel very disconnected, right? We live very, very rushed and fragmented lives and people spend hours sitting in traffic and 
they're under a lot of pressure with their boss and maybe their coworkers got laid off so they have to do the, their own job and their coworkers job too but they're not getting paid anymore and or maybe they're having to move around a lot and so on. I mean our lives our modern lives have a lot of drawbacks to them, right? So people need a way to feel connected to a simpler past, to their ancestors, to a community. And when they follow paleo, they can feel that connection. You know, it's just emotionally is extremely gripping, and I think that's why it's been so successful, because there's no science there whatsoever, and there's no long-term results other than, you know, if you've been living off donuts like my coworker's fiancé, and then all of a sudden you go to salmon and spinach, yeah, maybe you are going to feel better for a while, but there's certainly no science saying it's the optimal diet by any means because it's not. But people, unfortunately, sometimes do lose weight and and improve their diabetes on these horrible high-protein diets. Yeah, but the kind of deterioration of their body is going on under the surface because all this inflammation is still there. It's just being temporarily masked. And compared to what they were eating before, yeah, they could feel better. But, you know, so people don't understand it's, not optimal because they really don't understand protein. They think they can only get protein from animal sources. They think they have to eat animal foods to be healthy. You know, they think it tastes good. They think it's a normal and natural part of eating. So there's so many myths out there. Uh And, you know, so that's why people keep doing it. Why are people eating more and more animals? Well, there's certain statistics to show that animal consumption per capita is going down. Those statistics are maybe a few years old. Whether that trend's continued, we don't really know. But I really do feel this paleo story has gripped millions of people and is the reason why, you know, there's been such a huge upsurge in how much meat people eat. But, you know, it's so funny because, like, they have this, I think it's on the VegSource website or maybe on Dr. McDougall's website about the different people that advocate different diets. And the people, I believe his name is Lawrence Cordain. I've never met him, but all the pictures I've seen of him, it shows that he's fat. And when you see the people that champion the plant-based diet, like Dr. Popper and McDougall and Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard, they're, they're all lean and mean, you know? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, people don't really look at the facts. I mean, most people don't sit down and scientifically weigh the facts and read medical textbooks and all that kind of thing. They're, they're going to kind of go with what somebody they trust tells them, and that somebody they trust might be their physician, it might be their best friend, it might be a family member. And wherever that person got their information from or their misinformation from, that's what people are going to tend to trust. And they're also going to look around and see what other people are doing. So if for example, you work in an office and most of your coworkers are on some kind of, you know, paleo diet and they're worried about how many carbs they're eating and, you know, whether it's really safe to have, you know, anything other than a little bit of spinach with your giant uh, bowl of meat, then you're going to start thinking that way because, you know, we're social animals and we tend to do that. I mean, even if it were healthy and we know that these high-protein diets aren't, it, to me, they don't seem sustainable because they always seem to have to have cheat days. You know, I don't have to have a cheat day because I love everything I eat every day. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And they have to have cheat days because their bodies aren't getting what they need. Which are I carbohydrates, mean, complex carbohydrates. Exactly. And and they're not getting the other plant-based nutrients as well. I mean, when you think about plants, and we know this from Dr. Campbell in his book, Whole, which I these, you know, kind of like the Albert Einstein of nutrition tome out there, you know, that there's millions of substances in whole plant foods, literally millions. And we don't even know what most of them are. We don't know how they work together. We don't know how much of them we need. So really the best thing we can do is eat a varied whole food plant-based diet and not really worry about specific nutrients. Like you'd ask about how much protein a person needs. Well, you need as much protein as you get on a whole food plant-based diet mm-hmm. that supplies as many calories as you need. That's how much you need. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you you just can't worry about specific nutrients because there's no way you can measure that. You know, he makes a point in whole that, you know, even if you eat two apples from the same tree, they're going to have different nutrient profiles because maybe one grew on top of the tree and one grew on the bottom of the tree a few days later. And, you know, maybe the uh, circulation in the tree is carrying certain nutrients of this branch and other nutrients of that branch. So 
there's no way in the universe you can even know what nutrients you're eating. So to start worrying about it and micromanaging that, it's just the kind of thing of getting in your own way. You're just getting in your own way and you do that. You want to eat a wide variety of foods and you want to eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full and, you know, get out and move now and then. I mean, those are just really the basic rules. Sure. Now, you mentioned six kinds of whole foods. I'm guessing it's fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, maybe nuts and seeds? Right. And the six is herbs and spices, which... Oh, the six is the herbs and spices. Ah, good. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, those are important because they contain a lot of phytonutrients. I mean, the very taste and fragrance and unique kind of, you know, bite or whatever of whatever spice you're eating, whether it's garlic or lemongrass or cinnamon or, you know, oregano or whatever kind you like. I mean, I I like almost all herbs and spices. They're very, very high in these plant-based nutrients, the phytonutrients, more dense in terms of, you know, how much you're going to get in a little bit than any other kind of food. So it's good to eat flavorful foods. And the other thing about flavorful foods is they keep you from getting bored. So... You know, if you wisely use herbs and spices, you could have rice and beans every night for a month and you would never be eating the same, you know, dish twice because you'd have different vegetables in it and different spices in it and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I do love herbs and spices, but what is it about cilantro? It's one of those herbs that people either love or hate. Yeah, you know, and their taste can change. I used to love cilantro, and lately I find I don't like the flavor nearly as much. I'm not sure exactly why that is but you know there's certain other foods like for example broccoli and dr neil bernard writes about this where some people are fine with broccoli and love it and other people just cannot tolerate the taste of it at all yeah seems to have something to do with genetics about whether you can uh have the genetic capacity to sense certain compounds in the food that might taste or or, or bad yeah some people have those genes and some people don't so if there's a kind, there's no one kind of food you absolutely have to eat. If you don't right. like broccoli, don't eat it. If you don't like cilantro, don't eat it. If you're allergic to soy or, or you have some, you know, um, I don't know, been convinced or brainwashed that soy is bad, then don't eat soy. There's no yeah. one food that you absolutely must have. So, right. you know, just leave whatever out of your diet you want as long as you're eating a very wide variety of foods. You want to eat abundantly of all the kind of foods. You want to eat an abundance of vegetables and fruits. But those don't have many calories, so to get the calories you need, you also want an abundance of uh, beans and potatoes and whole grains and maybe an occasional handful of nuts and seeds just to kind of keep your body going. Because the most important nutrient, in a sense, is actually the calorie. I mean, people think calories are bad, but if Mm -hmm. we didn't have calories, none of us would be alive. So calories are the most basic nutrient in food, and we have to get enough of them, but we want to get them from healthy sources, right? We don't want to get them from soda and donuts. We want to get them from good food. And where do you get yours from? Like, a lot of listeners love to know what our guests eat. That's just always one of their top questions is, do we exercise and what do we eat every day? Well, I do try to eat a wide variety. For breakfast, when I have time to cook, I make oatmeal. And I put in a couple tablespoons of ground flax seeds, uh, a little bit of plant milk, a lot of fruit, yeah. uh, some cinnamon. That's my favorite breakfast. Or I sometimes I make other kinds of hot cereal, like mixed whole grains. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes, you know, I'll have leftovers for breakfast. I mean, you can always heat up some soup for breakfast or, you know, just whatever you have. You know, lunch and dinner, really, when I was working in more of an office setting, I would just bring a lot of food in the office with me. Like I'd bring in a sandwich on whole grain bread and some leftovers, maybe some brown rice with, um, you know, beans and some kind of sauce or pasta, you know, whole grain pasta in um, some kind of tomato sauce with a lot of vegetables thrown in or things like that. Uh, Now that I'm kind of cooking more for myself, I just keep a lot of good food in the refrigerator. And when I get hungry, I just go, you know, here's some leftover lentil soup, or <laughs> I can steam a few potatoes and put them, mix them in with some salsa or chopped up tomatoes and spices, or, 
you know, really just tend to eat kind of informally. You know, I don't yeah. really do a meal plan. I know a lot of people benefit from meal plans, and uh-huh. I think they're great, but I'm not that disciplined to have a meal right. plan. So what I do, I really buy a lot of my food at the farmer's market. I go to the farmer's market, see what looks good, you know, what's kind of appealing to me, and, and buy several bags of it. Sometimes I'll come home with three, four, five bags full of produce. Uh-huh. And then when I get home, I figure out, how I'm going to cook it because I always have staples in the house like brown rice and whole grain pasta and, and lentils and beans and things like that. So I just kind of go more spur of the moment rather than the mm-hmm. whole meal thing. But people should do whatever works for them. Right. Right. Absolutely. Are you big on moving? Moving your body, that is? Not moving your uh, geographical location, which you actually have done recently. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not big on moving my geographical location. Believe me, that is highly stressful. But in terms of moving my body, yeah, I love it. And and one of the benefits I'm really looking forward to is being able to do that more. So, you know, I love to just walk and uh, just really just move. I mean, I want to start bike riding again because I, I think that's really fun. I haven't had time to do that in a while. But I enjoy moving. I don't like sitting because... You know, we found that being sedentary, long stretches of being sedentary, even if you exercise, right. are actually very harmful. Mm-hmm. And, for example, uh, being sedentary for long stretches actually doubles the risk of diabetes. There's been a number of studies that kind of cluster, they all kind of cluster around the double the risk type mark. And, you know, so I, I really try to get up. I try to, you know, work standing up sometimes and, and just get up and move, even if it's just to go get a glass of water and maybe check, you know, on something or something like that. It's really important to move around partly in terms of focused exercise and partly in terms of just like not sitting for hours and hours. Right. Right. And so many Americans have desk jobs and they are sitting for hours and hours. Yeah. And it's hard because it's not always easy to get your boss to give you a standing desk. I, I saw that in my office where, you know, there were one or two people that got standing desks, but they had their pretty good medical reasons for it. Whereas, you know, I really would want to advocate for everybody have a standing desk and to be encouraged to use it because yeah. there's nobody who's not going to benefit from getting up. And if you don't have a standing desk, the best thing you can do is just kind get of up. make your own time to get up and move around. So, sure. Sure. you know, just go and get some water, go over, chat with a colleague or you know, take a short break. If you're on the phone, stand up when you're on the phone. You know, if mm-hmm. you're looking for something you can't find it in the desk drawer, stand up while you're looking instead of sitting. Just every excuse you can to get up and move, even if you're only taking two steps in each direction, really do that. It makes a difference, sure. And your bio, it says that you're the nutrition director of the nonprofit Nurses for Health. What is that? Well, Nurses for Health is a pretty new nonprofit, which I'm very excited about. You know, we're really just organizing now. But the idea is that a lot of nurses especially, they um, are often very caring people and work very hard to take care of their patients, but they don't take care of themselves. So when you look at nurses, huge numbers of them are actually overweight. Um, You know, they don't eat very well. Uh, They just don't take care of themselves. It's one of the more unhealthy groups of Um, occupations, unfortunately. So this nonprofit was started by a friend of mine who's a nurse, and I'm working with her, and and there's a couple other board members. And we are, you know, aimed to really educate nurses about how to get healthy, you know, how to eat better and exercise more, and also that, you know, they can take care of themselves and also do a better job taking care of patients because, you know, it's really hard to take care of other people when you're sick yourself. Mm-hmm. Neat. Very cool. So we're almost out of time. So one of the things I'd like to ask you, Dr. Stanger, you don't have to answer in the plant-based uh, world, but who inspired you in your life to do what you're doing? Well, my first inspiration was my children when I saw how absolutely steadfast they were in, you know, doing what they said they were going to do. I found that very inspiring. Another is my grandmother who... Uh, is not with us anymore, but she came to this country from Europe when she was 16, and uh, she only had a couple relatives here, but she was very educated. She spoke five languages. She would 
you know, save her money so she could go to the opera and the theater and things like that, even though she was very poor. And I always found her a brilliant woman, and I just loved spending time with her and admired her no end. And, and she really inspired me to want to study and learn and, and kind of be as good as I could be just intellectually and in terms of how I related to other people. And in terms of plant-based, really, I have to tell you, A.D., there's certain people that inspire me, like, for example, Dr. Uh, Campbell, especially, and pretty much everybody who's well-known in the movement. I would certainly put you in that. But everybody, to me, everybody who's working in the plant-based space, whether they're educating people as nutritionists or chefs or authors or whether they're writing and singing songs or, or painting art or working as educators or teachers or founding nonprofits or, or whatever they're doing. I really find that inspiring. I find it very inspiring when people are willing to live what they believe. So if people mm-hmm. are actually going out and doing what they believe and putting it into action, yeah. then I really admire that person and I'm inspired. And, and they don't even have to be in the you know, plant-based space. I mean, maybe they're, you know, helping victims of a disaster or, you know, sure. rescue animals or, or whatever they're doing. I find that enormously inspiring that, that people are going to actually act. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's, that's a great answer. So tell us how we can find out more about you. Do you have a blog? Do you have a website? Where can we buy your book and find out where you're going to be speaking? Well, Perfect Formula Diet is my website and the best uh, tab on that to go to is a blog because I update that uh, as frequently as I can, which will be more frequently now that I'm not in the office environment. So just go to Perfect Formula Diet slash blog. And uh, also, in in terms of where I'm going to be speaking, I will start posting that on my site for now. As I said, when I was working full-time in a corporate environment, I was putting a lot of my energy into working with employers, which I would still like to continue doing, but um, I'm also going to be branching out. So I will be putting that on my blog. Another great place is my Facebook page, so please mm. friend mm-hmm. me on Facebook. I do have my picture up there, so if you're just searching for me, if you look at the picture on the invite for this call, you'll be able to match it to the picture so you can pick me out of the other 5,000 <laughs> Janice Sangers on Oh, I didn't realize it was such a common name. <laughs> It's funny. It's a com- it is a common name. In fact, um, you know, it's surprisingly common, which is strange to me. But at any rate, so Facebook is really good. Uh, PerfectFormulaDiet.com uh, is good. You can get the book on Amazon, both as an e-book or a print book. You can also uh, buy it through my site if you want an autographed copy. Otherwise, Amazon's probably the way to go. I, I do see a lot of people, you know, buying e-books which is mm-hmm. seems to be the favorite way for people to read books sure. anymore, and that's great. Yep. You can search for my name on YouTube, and you will find yes. two videos you talked about. Just yes, go to YouTube. and I watched them both, and, you know, I actually watched them when I was uh, walking on the treadmill, and they're, they're excellent. The one, the, 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 is it called The Ten Most Common Nutritional Myths is the second one, I believe. Fantastic, and please watch both of those. They're free, they're fabulous, and so many of the answers that you seek are in there, especially like how to respond to other people when they say stupid stuff to you, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yep. if you just put my name on YouTube, you'll find those two. And the the most professionally done ones are for the Vegetarian Society yes. of Hawaii. Yes. A couple yeah, more pirated yeah. versions that aren't very professionally done, but those two, um, they do a fantastic job with their videos. They do, they do. Well, it's just been such a pleasure talking to you. You're just such a wealth of information, and it, it just the, the hour just flew by. And I thank you so much for being here, and and thank you for the inspiring work you do and getting people to understand that protein ain't so important after all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. I was really delighted to speak Great. with you tonight. Thank you, and thanks all of you for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Thanks, everyone. Good night.